All right, so we, we, we define, we said two statements are logically equivalent if they have identically the same truth tables. So we're going to use that concept to um, prove a couple of these logical equivalencies. Um, one of the Morgan's laws says the negation of an or statement, so for example, it is not the case that P or Q, that's equivalent to not P and not Q. So when you negate an OR statement, you actually end up with, when you distribute the negation, you get an AND statement, and vice versa. Okay? So I want to prove, prove that this is this equivalent. We have two, two individual statements. So my truth table, I'll have uh, P and Q. Okay? And then I need, um, let's do P or Q. Okay, so P or Q is true if I have exactly, well, I have at least, at least one true. So it's true, 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 false. Okay, then I'm looking to do the negation, so it's not the case of P or Q. And that would have the exact opposite truth table. I just flip all these. If this is true, then this is false. False, false, true. Okay? So that's one of the truth tables I need. And now I need not P and not Q. Maybe I should have had uh, another two more columns for not P and not Q. But, or I can just do it over here. I mean, it's only said you have to do them in a certain order, but that would have been nice. Like not P would therefore be false, false, true, true. Not Q would be. Uh, false, true, false, true, and then not P and not Q. So for this statement to be true, I need both of these two columns to have true. That only happens in the, in the, in the fourth row, right? Not P, not Q. So only in the fourth row is there true, so the rest would be false, false, false. Looks familiar. So this is equivalent. Th these statements are equal. They're logically equivalent because their two tables are identical. I think, you know, some say, like, how can you, I mean, what else do you need to do or say? I mean, this is fine. I mean, if you, if you just kind of circle these two, you know, if you wanted to write a sentence, you say, you know, they're logically equivalent because their truth tables are identical. That's fine. So this is what I mean. It, it can't just be the fact that they both have three Fs and one T. I mean, it has to be the same exact identical, row for row. So false, 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 true. Question? Do you want to turn our homework to draw out every single column or just the not P, I just do that in my Okay, so you have, you have maybe these rows you wouldn't do? Um, I mean, I guess. I mean, you get more use. Here, you know, we're, we're doing at the beginning, it might be good to include these. Start showing too little work. Maybe I'll make this statement sound more complicated. With that, I mean, I know it didn't take that long really to do this. Now we, I, and I, I try not to assign too many where you have like eight, eight lines. I didn't assign any that had what, sixteen lines? Did I? Hmm. Like, like P or not Q implies uh, R or. R and S. not S. Right. That'd be a good one. Right. Sixteen lines. <laughs> uh, four T. Thirty-two lines. Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, we do. So that's that's the Morgan's law. The uh, you know the the other the Morgan's law where you had it was a, you start out with an and statement here the negation of P and Q equals not P or not Q. I mean it works you know very similar. All right, um, another one I want to use one of the distributive laws. Okay, so here's one of the three statements. So, P 
P and Q or R. Okay, so think about that. So we have P and Q or R. So when would a statement like that be true? An and statement is true if both of these are true. So P has to be true, and but for, for a Q or R to be true, only one of them has to be true, right? So this, you can think of this, I'm telling you it's equal to P and Q or right, P and R. So does, does that make sense? If I said P and Q or R is a true statement, that's the same as saying that P is true and Q is true, or P is true and R is true. That also means that they both could be true, right? Right, the, the, the or, or they could be both, or both could be true, correct. One or the other, or both. Okay? All right, so let's look at, so I'm going to need eight rows here, right? So true, 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 false, false. False, false. Q is going to be true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. R is going to be true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. All right, so I'm going to use, um, let's do, I need a Q or R column. So Q or R, I'd get a true if I have at least one true in these rows. So, so for Q and R, so true, true is true, true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false, that's false, true, 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 false, true, false, true, true, false, false, false. Any questions about that? All right. Um, then I need a row for or a column for P and let's do P and Q or R. Okay. So the first statement. Uh, yeah, we do that way. I'm gonna say maybe we should do columns for P and Q and then a column for P and R, and then maybe put our last two statements that we're trying to show equivalent right next to each other. Would that be would that look nicer? Mm -hmm. Is it more correct? I don't know. No. So let's do, what did I say? <coughs> Q, let's do P and Q, and then I'll do P and R. So I have all the three you know, uh, pieces, and then I'll do P and Q or R, and then I'll do P and Q or R. P and R, and then it, 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 it looked kind of nice because like the last two columns should be identical, right? Mm -hmm. That'll be a nice, nice way to present your findings here. All right, so P and Q, we need both P and Q to be true to get a true. So first, so true, 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 false, false. And then false. Oh, the, the last four rows are all falses on, on P. So the, the rest of this has to be. I need to get my rows lined up. You guys have lined paper, don't you? So what's that? True, true, false, false. And then since, since P is false, the last four rows are false. False, 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 false. P and R. Okay, so I need. I have, True, 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 false, true, 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 false. And again, the last four rows of P are false, so P and R, the last four rows are all false. All right. So let's do P and Q or R. So P and then and Q or R. All right. So I got. True, 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 false, false, 
And then again, since P is false on all four rows, the last four rows, I know that these have to be false, 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 false. Okay, so that's what we're looking for in this last column. All right, so now I'm looking at these two columns. I need to have at least one true for P and Q or P and R to be true. So I have true, 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 false, that's true, false, true, that's true, and then the rest are all falses. You look side down for me. Okay. So, um, the saying that, you know, so now you can interchange these statements. If you have a, if you say P and Q or P and R, that's the same saying P and Q or R. But later on, if we were to use this, would we refer to this as distributed one, or we use this as like um, rule five? You know, it, um, I, I'm not going to refer to them by number, you know, I mean, you know, you, the reason why, you know, we're practicing showing the statements are equivalent is because later when we prove statements, it'll be often easier to prove an equivalent statement. So, you know, we're just getting practice, you know, I probably won't, we're probably not going to use this in a proof, you know, so I'm not going to, we're probably not going to need to refer back to this. But it is useful to know that, that you know if you distribute an AND statement, you get you know if you have, just like the regular distributive law, you know, um, and the same thing works for OR. The negations will come in. We'll, we'll, we'll need the negations um, probably more than than these type of statements because I showed you an example where the contrapositive is equivalent to the to a if then statement. So, but it involves negations. Okay. So I don't think I can't. I mean, I can't say for sure, but I don't think we'll ever have to refer back to this particular thing. And I probably will never say, "Well, yes, according to the Morgan's law, we have to." But I mean, I might. You know, we can just we just need. To, I, I I usually don't call by name. I would say, "Well, the negation of an AND statement isn't OR. The negation of an OR statement is an AND statement." So you can kind of toggle back and forth when you negate. Okay. Any other questions? So, um, you guys, I guess I've already, I just already told you your homework from 2.6, right? So, maybe you've already finished it. I don't know. So, I guess you, you guys have any other questions about truth tables? Okay, so 2.6 is done. Let's do, uh, let's talk about 2.7. Okay, so some of the, some sentences, um, that we've talked about so far, where we haven't, there's some st statements that occur in mathematics that we haven't <coughs> developed enough symbols to um, to rewrite these statements in, in symbolic logic. Um, so we're going to kind of fill in the gaps with these, uh, these these symbols called quantifiers. Okay, so that's section 2.7. Quantifiers. Okay. I mean, they're called quantifiers. I mean, you got the word quantity, kind of the same, you know, prefix there. So these are um, symbols that refer to a quantity. There's a lot of statements um, in mathematics that refer to quantities, like something is true for all integers, and so you're, you're saying something that's universal about every integer. Um, or you say every every integer is even or odd. So I'm saying a statement about everything, every, all all integers. Sometimes you you just say you use you talk about some or um, like some some integers are even, some integers are prime. Um, so that refers to a quantity. I, I mentioned this the other day. It's some when you say some, if you had a homework problem that said like some sets are finite, that just means at least one set is finite. Um, so I'm just talking about there are there there does exist a set that's finite. Okay, so those are uh, sentences that are, uh, occur a lot in in math theorems. 
Okay, and so when we, uh, I'm going to show you the uh, the symbols for those for those uh, statements. Okay, so the phrases um, there is. Um, There exists <coughs> a phrase for all and for every. These phrases, um, and it's, it's slight variations, like just the word all, just the word every, or sometimes the word some instead of there is. Or there exists, sometimes you say some. <laughs> so there's variations of these. And these phrases occur uh, frequently. They appear frequently in, in, in math uh, theorems. Okay. So for these statements, we need some these quantifiers to help us break down these statements in symbolic logic, and so then we can apply um, our, our knowledge of, like, for example, Morgan's Law. It's like, what if you negate uh, a statement that says a quantifier? Um, so we'll, we'll talk, we'll look, at, we'll look at that a little bit later. But, uh, okay, so here's an example, um, two examples. There is an integer. That is even and prime. Okay. So the, you'll see we're, we're going to do some we're going to do some translations. We'll, we'll have statements and we'll translate them into symbols, and then we'll have symbols. We'll try to translate them back into phrases. And you know, mathematicians can get kind of specific and kind of use English in a kind of weird way. You know, instead of saying there is an integer that is even and prime, you know, a more kind of standard way, like if you're just sitting around talking, you, you would probably say something like, you know, some integers are even and prime. Um, that's probably maybe more, uh, le or let's say, less mathy, math speaking kind of way. But we, we say these sentences all the time. There is an integer that, that is even and prime. Or something, or you could say, there exists an integer that is even and prime. I mean, you probably don't talk like that, right? Like, um, like, you know, is a uh, is there any milk in the fridge? There exists some milk in the fridge. You know, it's like no, there's, there's some milk in the fridge. You know, it's just you know, but mathematicians might, you know, logically those are equivalent. You know, it's like yeah, that's annoying. So all right, so there is an integer that is even and prime. So what I'm getting at is when you see the symbols, you try to translate that back to an English phrase. And it might come out like a robot speaking instead of, instead of like, so it, it kind of would be better if you could even translate it to like a more normal phrase. But I'm not going to say this is wrong, even though it might not be exactly the way we speak. Okay. So think about that. Um, here's another one. How about, um, every natural number is positive. I mean, that's a statement about all natural numbers. Now, the first statement, the, the, these are actually both true statements, by the way, right? Every There is an integer that is even and prime. Even if I said some integers are even and prime, those are both true statements. It's it's true because I can find at least one. The, the number two is, is both even and prime. Every natural number is positive. Well, the natural numbers are one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, they're, they're both they're all positive. Okay, but that's true for every single one of them. Okay, so we're gonna look at how how do we how can we write these. Um, Using symbols, we don't right now. Let's see. Well, we could probably write this one without uh, quantifiers, and I'll show you. I'll show you how you can do that. But this one, I think you really need uh, a quantifier that that describes this 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 phrase. There is or there exists. Okay. 
So here, here are the symbols. The quantifier. I'm curious, you know, how these symbols come about, but uh, we need the first. So a backwards capital E. So if you type up your homework, good luck finding these symbols on your. Um, They're somewhere in there. Yeah, they're, they are somewhere. I mean, I've used Microsoft Word. You can find these symbols. If you use other software for, you know, you might. Um, I have a hard time finding these, but anyways, so backwards E. This is the symbol that stands for those phrases there is, there exists, or some. Okay? This stands for um, there is, or there is a, um, there exists, there exists a, um, and then also the word sum, like I could have said, some integers are even in prime, or there exists an integer that is even in prime, or there is an integer that is even in prime. Okay. But it's not for everybody in prime. <laughs> it is not for all. It is another symbol for all. And it looks like this. So it's an upside down A. So. I think they tried a backwards A for a while and it didn't work too well. <laughs> <laughs> so they went upside down. And I, I, you know, I couldn't do an upside down capital E either, I guess, right? So <coughs> upside down A stands for you know this for all or for every. And there's other variations. I mean you could just say the word all instead of for all or like like. Like all even all natural numbers are positive, um, or every natural number is positive. So all or every, and again, this is where experience kind of comes in. When you see a symbol, you would just you you end up reading it with the you know all the little. Uh, words that you, that you need to make it a, a proper English sentence. Okay. So, so these are these are standard symbols. It's not just this author made up these symbols. I mean, mathematicians know what these mean. That's what they what they mean. So, do we still use any of our set builder symbols, or any of this are completely separate? Set builder like uh, intersections like, and like elements. Oh yeah, yeah. You combine all these. These are all. These are just no more. Logical logic symbols, and so we'll have sentences that can use all the things. Element of that's what you you often see uh, for every for every natural number or every natural number. So that's how I would. This is how I would write the word. Write write the how I translate this. I would say every natural number. So for every element n of the natural numbers. I mean, it's you can you can. Try to like translate it literally, like for every n that is an element of the natural numbers. I mean, that's how you would literally translate this. For every n that is an element of the natural numbers, well, why don't you just say every natural number? And that's more of a you know, easier way to say this. So when you see this, you end up you end up hopefully at, you know maybe at first you'll you'll literally translate it word by word, but then you'll get the the meaning of it. This means Every natural number, every natural number. If you have a sentence like every natural number is positive, we could we could like that. Well, let's do that. So every natural number is positive. I wrote that. So I would write for every n that's a natural number, or for every natural number n, and yeah, you could actually write it in words, and it's positive. But there's there's even more math symbols that we have for saying something that's positive. We mean it's greater than zero. Yeah. So you could you could even just say. That's even more more concise than actually using the word positive. Okay, so these mean the same thing. N is positive, N is greater than zero. Okay, 
So this would be a way you can translate the phrase, every natural number is positive. Okay, any questions so far? How about, um, oh, one more thing, I, I meant only to define, you know, call, the names of these, when you say there exists, they call this the um, existential quantifier. So, it, it, you'll see, maybe, not like, what is the meaning of life quantifier? It's an existential, like, existence, I mean, it's, this is the existential quantifier. That's just what it's called. I guess it's just sounds more proper than the, the backwards capital E. Um, saying that all the time. We use the backwards capital E. You say want to use the existential quantifier. Um, then the upside down capital A. That's called the universal quantifier. You can see why, I mean, it's because it, it, it talks about everything, the whole universe, every single natural number. If your universe is natural numbers, every natural number is positive. So we're saying something universal about all things that we're considering. Okay. So you might hear those words, um, universal quantifier, existential quantifier. All right. So basically, um, the rest of 2.7, I'm going to give you some examples of phrases, or sense statements, rather, and how would you translate them using uh, quantifiers? And then, kind of vice versa, you, I'll give you a statement and symbols. You could try to unravel it, uh, re rewrite it as an English, English sentence. Okay? So 2.7, the, the homework is, is, is actually translating logical symbols back into English. So uh, what we're actually getting to is where you can take a statement, turn it into our terms of our P and Q, and then prove whether the statements are true or false with true or false statements. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea. I mean, we, you know, to, to truly, you know, sometimes to, to understand exactly what a, a statement is saying, because you maybe want to try to prove it. Well, if you can translate it to, to, to symbolic symbols to symbolic, symbolic logic, then you can use, um, like maybe you have a if-then statement, so then maybe you can, you can rearrange it to make it a contrapositive type statement that's equivalent and prove that, that might be easier somehow. Okay, so that's the idea that maybe, maybe we translate it in, into logic so you can really understand, make sure you're absolutely certain what the statement is saying, but also maybe you can translate it to logic. Um, I mean, usually, you know, this is not like a, a step you would do when you're proving statements, but it, it could be something on the side you could do, just kind of to convince yourself you know exactly what the statement is saying. And now for this class, I mean, we're, our statements are going to be pretty straightforward. We're often going to be, you know, if-then statements. Um, but it, it, is, it is definitely good to know these symbols. I mean, these are used all through uh, mathematics. Um, above, above this class, I mean, you know, you can use, you know, you might see these type of symbols. Um, any of you take, what do you call it? Is it real analysis one or analysis one? What do they call it? called analysis. Analysis. I mean, you'll see, you should see this all the time. Has anybody taken that yet? Or taken it now? Or? I think this class is a This is a prerequisite for that. <laughs> that's why. I mean, you use these symbols all the time. For, you use them, you'll use them on every, every problem you do when you're writing uh, delta epsilon proofs of, of limits and things. I mean, you use them all the time. So, all right. Oh, I, I had another sentence on the board, right? Yes. Sorry. There is an integer that is even and prime. Okay. Okay, so there is. You're thinking that's you know that big capital backwards capital E existential quantifier. So there is an integer. Okay? So usually, you know, oftentimes you use n. It doesn't have to be the letter n. It can be x. But you can say there's a there's an element of the natural uh, the element of the integers. Okay? So I'll probably write it like this. So 
there exists an n that's an element of the integers. And you could literally translate that like that, but more likely you would translate it as there is an integer. There is an integer n. Okay? Such that you just kind of your comma, and then what what about n? Well, n is even and n is prime. So it's an and statement. Okay? N is even and n is prime. So one thing I, I didn't want to mention, well, any questions first about this? The use of the Could you just not have n equals two? Okay. Well that's equivalent to what I said, but uh, well, no, you're, no well, that you're you're proving that's not saying that so n equals two that's not a that's an open statement. But this is a this is a open sentence. But this is you're, this makes you think of the number two, right? The number two proves that this is a true statement, but saying there's an integer called two, that's not really the same as this. Could you say statement. for every number or for every n it's an element of z o d n equals two? Or is that just not? Um, so you're saying if every integer equals two? No. Yeah, I yeah. see that. You know what I'm saying? Whole. So you'd have to say yeah. there is an integer, there exists an integer n such that n is even and n is prime. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, that's how you would translate that, literally. But now I know, I mean, the reason why this is a true statement is because that number two does exist mm -hmm. out there. Um, so if I said prove this statement, you would say, well, the number two. Yeah. The number two is even and the number two is prime. The number two is an integer, so therefore this is a true statement. Okay. So some of these statements, you know, just to get some statements, they might not even necessarily be true. I mean, th these two statements were true so far. But I can just write some sentences that we can translate, and they're not necessarily even true. Okay. So, how about this sentence? Some integers... Are not prime. Some integers are not prime. So the word "sum." We're not talking about every integer here. We're talking about some of them. So that's that's the the same existential quantifier. Some integers are not prime. Um, so what we're saying is. One way, literally, there exists an, an integer n such that what? How can I write the condition here for n? The negation. N is not n prime. Yeah. If, if you use, there's a word not there, so they kind of want you to use that negation symbol. So it is not the case that what? N is prime. I mean, you could have written such that n is not prime, but they kind of, when they say that, when they use the word not, I think they, they, they would want you to, you know, it's like a homework problem, they want you to kind of use that negation symbol. Is there a reason why we're using a comma now for such that rather than a colon? Yes, because we're not using, is this not set notation? Um, it's just, it's just, you know, it's kind of like, you'll get used to this as, as just, uh, it's almost like you can, in mathematics, you can use real words, like real English words, and then you can throw in these these symbols, and you just kind of mix and match oftentimes when you start writing your proofs. And so this is like a, a sentence. So a sentence, in a sentence, grammatically, a, a, a colon means something different. right? It kind of means like stop here, and then like you're giving like a, a clarification of something you said here. And so, yeah, now we use a comma. That's a good point to note out, to note that, you know, it, it's like we're writing a sentence here, we're just writing it in a different language. I mean, this is really a new language, symbolic language. Okay. Yeah, so we would, we would use commas here. And so you could read this literally, <coughs> there exists an n, which is an element of integers, such that it is not the case that n is prime. That would be a literal translation. But that's not really, you know, the idea of when I say translate this back to English, you can do a little translation, and that's fine. But what, what, the, what are you trying to get at here? You're trying to say that, 
Okay, some integers, or there exists an integer that is not prime. There exists an integer that's not prime. That might be a more common way to translate this. There exists an integer that is not prime. Or there is an integer that is not prime. Or some integers are not prime. It's even, you know, we kind of be better. So there's more than one correct way to translate this back to English, right? Some of them are more normal sounding uses of uh, English. Any, any other questions? Uh, The square of every real number is non negative. Is this true or false? False. The square of every real number. So I mean, you take a number and square it. So you take a number, uh, take any real number, square it. Is that going to be non-negative? Yeah. Yes. So this, this is a true statement. The square of every real number is non-negative. So that's you know pretty normal sentence. I mean it's a math sentence, but it doesn't start off with a, a every. But there is this every here. Okay. So we're using the universal quantifier here. For so, every real number. The square is non negative. Okay. So for every. Any square that you don't want. Well, this is a statement about every real number. So I would start off with for every real number. Okay. So you can, you know, it's not necessary, but it's common. X is used for a real number, an arbitrary real number. N, it's usually when you have a more discrete set like natural numbers or integers. It's not necessary. I mean, you can use. Which is common, n and m often are the are arbitrary integers. x and y are often the arbitrary real numbers. It has, it's not more correct because I'm using the x. I'm just saying, just want to want you guys to see, you know, what's common, commonly done. Okay, so right here, this statement right here. This means for every real number x, okay, or for every real number, for every real number x, what is true about that? X. The X squared. Square. X squared, the square of X. Greater than or equal to zero. Excellent. So for every real number X, X squared is greater than or equal to zero. So to translate that back to English, you get you maybe start off with for every X, there's an element of the real numbers. It is the case that x squared is, is greater than or equal to zero. And then you kind of think about what, what is this statement really saying? What you're really getting at is that the square of every real number is, is non negative. <laughs> I mean, you could say greater than or equal to zero in your translation. But, okay? Any questions? Every subset of the integers is finite. First of all, true or false? Every subset of the integer is finite. False. Say it's false. Why? That you said is finite. That's zero. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean for finite? The integer is less than an infinite number. Therefore, it's an infinite ah, subset. The integers is a subset of itself, and the integers are not finite. Finite means it has finitely many elements. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah. So you can. I mean, there's an, there's actually an infinite number of subsets that are, have infinite order. So 
Think about all the multiples of two. That's an infinite set. All the multiples of three. That's an infinite set. All the multiples of four. That's an infinite set. I mean, but they're all subsets of integers. Okay. So, are some infinities bigger than other infinities? Like, is that kind of weird, right? Like, the integers has an infinite number of numbers, but they have there's many sets that are an infinite number of sets that have infinitely many elements that are proper subsets of, of energy. Ah, all right. So I digress. Let's see. What is this a backwards e or upside down a? Upside down a. Every right. Every all sum. Uh, uh, sorry. Every for every for all. Those are, are your universal quantifiers. All right. So what are the what are the objects we're talking about here? We're making a statement about. Power. Subsets of the integers, right? So every, so I'm not going to use a lowercase n for my arbitrary object. That would be like a number. An arbitrary set. What do sets look like? What do we use to, for sets? Capital letters. Right? Capital letters, right? So you could use capital X is kind of a common one we've used for sets. Um, capital A. For, I don't know. Yeah, that kind of looks weird, right? <laughs> For every capital A, you know, it's like, I, you could use I guess. Okay, so I'm going to use capital X, capital X, right? For an arbitrary subset. A set, but it's a subset. So how can I say that X is a subset of the integers? So it's a subset of the integers. For every... Subset of the integers, that's kind of the way I would read that. So for every set x that's a subset of the integers, how you would know, literally interpret that, what is true about that set x? Mm -hmm. So what is the definition of a set being finite? What do we know about its size? It's less than infinity. Less than infinity. So one way to do it is the size of x, and when we put absolute value bars around x, is less than infinity. That's one way to say it. I mean, you could just use words. You could just say the size of, or you could just say x is finite. But that's kind of it's kind of nice to use. It's all symbol. Would we also include before uh, zero is less than x is less than infinity? Not necessary. Because saying something is finite, it could be zero, it could be one, it could be two, it could be any any, any size other than infinity. Oh. I was thinking natural numbers. I think that's why. Oh, okay. It would be equivalent so. to say it to not equal infinity. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because, you know, there's only, the only cases for sizes are the whole numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to infinity. So, yeah, so the only thing you eliminate would be infinity. Yeah, I think it's way funnier. See, that's, I guess that's, could you, if you, if, would you, would you, would you think of that? As the same as saying it's finite, though, I think they're equivalent. You could say, I said, I think I'd probably stick with that. Maybe. I think say something is finite, is saying it's really less than infinity. Okay. Now you're you're true that they they, they would be equivalent though, because the size is, doesn't equal infinity, but it's forced to be less than infinity. Um. Would that one also be true if you said the negation of the absolute value equals infinity? Mm -hmm. But that probably wouldn't be the easiest way to translate this into symbols, so that you know they'd be equivalent. Now, I think I heard somebody say something about power set. Yeah? How could I write that using the power set notation? I would just think of replacing the uh, universal and the x, making a script p and then a symbol okay. for integers inside of it. Well, okay, so what I was thinking of, instead of saying that x is a subset of the integers like this, X is an element of the power set. Ah. So okay. saying that X is a subset of Z is the same as saying that it's an element of the power set of Z. You see how those mean the same thing? X is a subset of, of the integers is the same as saying X is an element of the power set of the integers. Because the definition of a power set is it's a set containing all the subsets of Z. Okay, so I, I want to point that out. I don't typically use the, that notation for power sets. When we, when, you know, this seems easier to me. Like you have to know another definition to, to know this 
this notation, but it is equivalent. And, and I, there's some examples in the book where they use that. They use the power set notation instead of just is a subset of. All right. Let's talk about combining quantifiers. Sometimes, I mean, you, you can actually have two arbitrary things you're talking about. Like, if I said the sum of two integers is an integer, I would say something, if you're saying something about two objects, you say for every x and for every y, x plus y is an integer or something. But um, really, so if you're using for every and for every back to back, or there exists and there exists, you, they're not, the order isn't that important. But I'm going to show you some examples where the order of makes a big difference here. Okay. All right. For every integer x, there is an integer y such that x plus y equals zero. So this statement has an every or for every and it has a there is or there exists phrase. So we're actually going to combine, we're going to have to use both quantifiers. Okay? All right. For every integer x, how would you translate that? For every integer x. Side x. Is that enough? Element of integers. Yeah, it's an element of integers. And here's here's the thing. If you you know if you're if say you're taking a number theory class where all you're talking about is integers, you oftentimes just forget the is an element of the integers statement. I mean you just you know you just, you might just say for every x there exists a y. But because you know maybe the whole semester, all you've been talking about is integers, so it's, it's implied that what the universe is. Okay, but you know it's not it's not bad to include that. Okay, so for every x, there's an element of the integer. Okay, so in other words, for every integer x, there is an integer y. There exists. There is an integer y. Such that, and I have another comma probably, such that x plus y equals zero. Okay. Any questions? How about this? There is an integer. Y such that for every integer X, um, we have that X plus Y equals zero. Almost saying the same as the previous sentence, but let's let's translate this one. So now it's saying there is an integer x. Sorry, there is an integer y first. We're saying that first, right? So there is an integer y such that for every integer x, so for every x an integer. We have that x plus y equals zero, and that's where you know you kind of supply your own. I don't need to say we have that. It's kind of like a such that therefore. Or, um, so I want you to look at these two statements. Only one of them is true. 
Which one's true and which one's false? What do you think about the first one? True or false? Let's take a look. True. False. Nobody? Okay, you're right. This is true. Which one's false? Let's think about exactly what this is saying. For every integer x, okay, it's kind of like no matter what integer you give me, okay, give me an integer x. No matter what integer you give me, there exists a y. I can find a y so that the sum x plus y is 0. So right? Like, like, like no give, somebody give me an integer. 2. Three. two. Well, I can find negative 2. At 2 plus negative 2 is 0. Okay? All right. Now look at the second sentence. There exists an integer y such that no matter what integer x you choose, x plus y equals 0. That's not true. It says that there is, there's, a, there's one y that no matter what other integer you add to it, you always get zero. It's not true. Why can't you do the opposite? If my y is 2, then I can get my x negative. It says that there's a, what this is saying is there's a y that works for every other integer. Okay, if we exactly it doesn't work that way. What this is saying is that no matter, for every integer, no matter what energy you start with, I can find a one that, that will make the sum zero. But you can't find a, a, a y that works all the time. Remember, this y depends on what you chose first. For every input, you have exactly one output. Or yeah, for every, no, it says for every, for, any, for every integer x, there is, I can find, there is, there's an integer y to make this sum equal to zero. But this statement says, there is an integer y that works all the time. There's an integer y such that you choose any other x, and the sum will always equal 0. That's not the case. So it really makes a difference the order. Okay. So this says, basically, for any, any, any energy you choose, there is a y. I can find a y to make this true. But you cannot find, it's not true that you can, that there's a y that works for every, for every x. There's a different y that works for every different x. Yes? Um, for the second one, if you said there is an integer y for every integer x, um, would that change the meaning? Well, it is, well, yeah, it would kind of, right? Like, because you're saying like they're, they're kind of paired up, like yeah, and that's kind of like what the first one is saying. There, for every x, there is a y, there is a pair that works, but yeah, you can't really you take out that word, that phrase such that because that's what that's why this is. I'm saying that's why this is wrong is because you're saying this is implying that this y works for every other x, and that's not that's not the case. Okay. Do. Uh... talking about integers. Okay, so that way I don't have to keep saying is an element of the integers, okay? All right. So I want to have symbolic logic over here, and I want to have a translation over here. And uh, let's say uh, true false, not third column. True false. Okay. 
Uh, what is an English translation of this symbolic sentence? For every x, there is a y that, or such that x times y is equal to zero. Okay. So for every x, there is a y such that x times y equals zero. For every, you know, I, I said we're talking about integers. So when I say for every x, I really mean for every integer x, right? For every x, there is a y such that uh, x times y equals 0. Is that true or false? True? So for every x, there there exists a y such that x times y equals 0. Okay, I agree. True. What if I change this? So there exists a y. Well, I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> what if I change the order of the yeah. So how would you translate that? Yeah. There exists a y. Such that for every x, x times y equals zero. Okay. So, uh, so there exists a, a y such that for every x. Uh, x times y equals zero. Hmm. Now we're saying there's a y that works for every x. Is true or false? True. So in this case, either one, if both these statements are true, and the, the reason is because even in the first sentence, the, uh, well, Zero works for, for almost every integer. But if I started out with if x was zero, then I could choose any other integer for y. But the second one, the number zero works for every number, every integer, right? Like I could choose zero for y, and no matter what x you give me, x times y is zero. And here, no matter what x I give you, whenever whatever integer I give you, I can find a y. There exists a y such that the product equals zero. Okay, if, if you start off with any integer other than zero, you, you better choose zero for y, right? But if you choose zero for x, you can choose a million for, for y, and then zero times a million will still be zero. Okay, so both these are true statements. What about this? Translate that. There is an x. Okay, there exists an x such that for every y, for every y, x is greater than y. Okay. So there is an x, or there exists an x. Such that for every y, x is greater than y. Isn't that not a way to put the first letter? Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of has to flow. I mean, where, where, where would you like to put it? Can you put it after the letter y? Uh, there exists an x for every, for every y, such that, yeah, I guess that would, that would that'd be fine. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, I, I usually write such that so many times I just write S period, T period. So if I do that, uh, that means. Okay. Um, true or false? False. False? There is, there exists an X such that for every Y, X is greater than Y. Is 
So, in other words, what we're getting at, how could you, how could you, we're saying that X is bigger than every other, every Y, right? So they're saying, there's an X that's bigger than every other integer. In other words, this statement, another one way of saying it is, uh, there is a biggest integer. That's probably the simplest way to translate this. That's the meaning of this phrase. That's untrue because that's using the assumption that's that false. integers are finite. It's false. So there is there is a biggest integer? No, that's false. There is no biggest integer. There is no x that's bigger than every other integer y. Okay, yeah, so that's a false statement. But you see how this is a kind of a more literal translation of these symbols? But wouldn't it be easier to say that somebody there's no biggest integer? Right? That's these these you know you might go from like here to here and then back to here, but so it's what's gonna be hard is like if you have a sentence like this and you want to rewrite it like in symbolic notation, there is a biggest integer. I mean it's, Maybe you will, probably wouldn't think of that off the bat as there exists an x, x such that for every y, x is greater than y. But that's these these mean the same thing. But the meaning behind them is the same. It'd be true if you switched the quantifiers, wouldn't it? For every okay. x, there is a y is bigger. Than yeah, that? yeah, that would be true, right? So if we switch the quantifiers, it would say for every for every y, there exists an x such that x is greater than y. So it's basically saying. For, you know, no matter what you pick, you can yeah. No matter what you pick, you can always find a bigger integer, right? You give me x, I tell x plus one, right? So yeah, if you switch the order, then it would be true. Okay. Right, any questions? No questions. Okay, so that finishes uh, two point seven. I'll post the all of them for the week. Um, after today, so. Page 51, number one through six. So if you get stuck, you know, this is where, it, it, you know, I don't want one, three, and five to look exactly like the back of the book. I mean, you know, there's many ways you can interpret these sentences. But you're, you're, you're given symbolic logic and actually you translate back to English. Okay? You can, you know, you can start off with your kind of more literal translations. Okay? Um, but, uh, you know, just give, give it a shot, one through six. Okay? Get stuck, you can try looking at the back of the book. Okay. Um, I'm going to let the camera roll, but let's take a one two minute break before we start the next section.
So let's get back. So 2.8, uh, there's a couple of these, two or three of these sections at the end of chapter 2 where the author is just trying to reiterate or trying to make this point about the subtleties in, 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 in logical notation. And they wanted to talk about P implies Q. Um, so um, you could have, you know, we know what an open sentence is. The sentence this, it, it, you can't say it's a statement because it depends on what the variable is. But when you have an open, sent, open statement here and an open statement here, you can still consider this to be a statement because it's usually referring to um, all things in your universe. Okay, so it, you know I said when 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 you make these statements over and over time, over and over and over, and you're using the same set like. We're always talking about integer. We often just drop the, the, the integer set if, it, if it's understood what the universe is. Okay? So when you say stuff like uh, if x is even, then x squared is even. I mean, what, what are the types of numbers that you talk about being even? You don't talk about rational numbers being even. You don't talk about complex numbers being even. You talk about integers or natural numbers, okay? So integers, really, you talk about, you know, if x is, in, so really when you say if x is even, then x squared is even, you really mean, you really mean for every integer x, if x is even, then x squared is even, okay? So we really mean um, for every integer x, <coughs> If x is even, then x squared is even. Okay? So oftentimes when there's a theorem or a statement we're about to prove that's a that's a con conditional P implies Q statement, it's really an x is it's really a universal statement about all elements of your of your set. So what he's the author is saying in this section is that just because you don't have this this phrase first, we still want to consider if x is even, then x squared is even. We still want to consider that as a statement that we can prove true or false. Okay, and this would be without without this uh, without this uh, quantifier. I would still say this is a true statement because if if x is uh, an even integer, then it is true that x squared is is even. Okay, and if you're talking about so any any x that you give. If you plug that in for, for this x, this will be a true statement. So this is true for all x's, but we just we still want to consider this a statement. He even goes so far as to make a, a definition that if you have, if p is an open sentence, if p is an open sentence, q is an open sentence, then p implies q is still a statement. Okay? So for example, this we'd say um, is, is a true, true statement. Okay? So if x is a multiple of 6, then x is even. Do you believe that? Is it true or false? If x is a multiple of 6, then x is even. x is true. And again, what they were saying is, this is true for every integer x. I mean, give me give me an integer, um, then this is true. Okay, and I'll show you in the next section how you you can actually any if then statement you can write it as um, a uh, 
for every statement, uh, universally quantified statement that the book is there. If E is prime, then P is odd. True or false? False. False. Because I can find a, a number that makes the first statement true, but makes the second statement false. So this if then statement would be false. Right? Two is prime, but two is, is, is not odd. So this would be a false statement. Okay? So even though these are if if P then Q, or you know, the P and Q are open statements, it's still when you combine them as a conditional sentence, we, we still consider these statements. Okay, so like a lot of theorems that you prove are in this form, if then statements. So he's just he's just pointing this out that he defines these just to make uh, certain that we still consider these statements. Okay, that's all from 2.8. 2.9, we're going to get back to translating English into symbols, okay? So in 2.7, for example, the, the uh, exercises in 2.7 are all symbols, and you had to convert them back to English. Now, 2.9 is focusing on translating English into uh, symbolic logic. Okay. And this, this stuff takes, you know, takes some takes some getting used to. Um, so here's some, some phrases. Can I do this one every integer is prime? Ranger is prime. So this is clearly false, right? It's not a true statement, but I'm just I'm just providing statements. We're going to practice translating them into symbolic language. So every integer is prime. Okay. What's the translation? Right? Yeah. On a. Talking about integers. And. Okay. So for every integer n, what about n? n is prime. Um, oh, I, I, I remember one thing I meant to say. When um, he uses this notation, I've never, I've never seen this before. Like if he says, instead of saying um, x is even, if you notice this in the book, he, he uses this re abbreviation, e of x. That's his notation for x is even. So what if I what if I wanted to say x is odd? Did you see what his notation is? O of x, which seems all right to you guys, right? But there's there's o capital O of x means something completely different in in, in upper mathematics. I mean, this means that the quantity is um, it, it talks about the, the relative size asymptotic behavior of of the quantity you're talking about. So. I mean, I, I don't like this notation, I, and I, I've never seen it. He didn't really, he never, I don't think, I couldn't find where he officially defined that. But he just started using that, like, so like E of N means N is even. I don't know, I'm not going to use that, but just, if you see that in the book, that's, just know that that's what it means. Okay, so every integer is prime for every uh, N element of the integer is N is prime. Okay. Oh, uh, so here's, here's a fact. Every universally qual uh, quantified statement, okay, for example, this one, so using the universal quantifier, so any statement like this, for every n, n is prime, okay? You can actually write them as a um, conditional statement, P implies Q type of statement. Okay? Every universally quantified statement can be written as a conditional statement. Okay? 
So if you have a statement like this, for every, for every integer n, n is prime. Okay? Let me show you how I could write that as a conditional statement. I could say n is an integer implies n is prime. So those two will be, um, both be correct symbolic notation for the statement every integer is prime. Okay? So anytime you have a for every a, a statement or a universally quantified, quantified statement, you can write it like this. For every, every integer is prime. Okay? So the saying is that if you have an integer, it must be prime. And that's what this statement is saying. So if you have an integer, it implies that uh, the integer is prime. Remember, so these are these are both false statements, right? I mean, this, this, no matter how you write it, it's still a false statement. Okay. All right. So how how another universally quantified statement? All integers are even. Okay. Clearly, another false statement. Right. Not all integers are even. Here's the same. All integers are even. So, similar to the first one, you would say something like all integers, so for every n in z, n is even. Right? How could you rewrite it, though, as a conditional statement? A P and plus P type statement. N and Z implies N is even. Okay. But either one will be will be fine. Like for, for example, you'd have to say all integers are even or odd. I mean, you could say that, right? I mean, that's a true statement. How would it change? That's a true statement. Maybe it's to make you think. Are, are these true? Um, so, yeah, this, this was a, uh, one sentence I saw in the, the book, x is even, but y is odd. Okay. So just, this example, just to point out that you don't see the word uh, for every, you don't see the word there exists, so this is not a quantified statement. You don't need the, the quantifier. But there's a but, this conjunction, but, and that, you have to interpret that as an and statement. Okay, so x is even, but y is odd. You would, you would just say x is even, and y is odd. Okay, so even though you don't see the and word, you have to translate conjunction but as and. Can, she, can she use the word existence? Well, I'm not saying anything about so I think we're the existence of, a, of an X or a Y. We're saying, I'm not saying anything for, for every... So in this, in 2.9, we don't have to have a quantified statement. It just, it just, this could have been in the previous section on, on, on and and or. I think okay. we're just trying to that for every right, well now you're thinking that way, right, because we haven't been using that today, but just think, I mean, so the only point of this example is that, that the word but you would interpret as and when you use symbol. Here's your quantifier statement here. How about this? So some integers are negative.
there exists. Okay. There exists uh, TN, 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 Touch that. Touch that. TN is less than zero. I like it. So that's what, you know, being negative means that it's less than zero. Right? Some integers are negative. There exists an integer n such that n is less than zero. So you see how, if you saw this and I said translate it back into English, you could give me a little translation of something like, there exists an n, that, which is an element of the integer, such that n is less than zero. Now, if you wrote all those words out, that would be correct. But really, the gist of this, but what's it trying to say? It's trying to say some integers are, neg are, are negative, right? Some integers are negative. That's a much easier uh, way to, to read this, translate it. Not all integers are positive. So maybe if you do this one, you might want to look at the phrase all integers are positive, and then the not, you just you know, use your negation symbol. Okay. So how would you write all integers are positive? So all integers, for every integer n, what? n is greater than zero. So I would say all integers are positive, but we're saying not all integers are positive. So you would say, you know, I'll put, maybe put parentheses around. I'm negating the whole sentence. It is not the case that every integer n is, is positive or greater than zero. Okay? Not all integers are positive. How could you say not all integers are positive in a different way? How could you, in just in English, how could you say not all integers are positive? Some integers are negative. negative. Okay. So you see how you switch from, a, this is a, this is used as a, a, a for all, and you found a way to say it with using a there exists statement. So we'll talk about that more in section 2.10 when we do the negation of a quantified statement. You could actually say, I mean, another way to, to get the same meaning across, you're really saying some integers are not positive, right? That's what I was saying. Not all integers are positive. You're saying, well, some integers are not positive. So some integers are not positive. Number four is the negation of number five. Nope. Close. So I, I purposely said some integers are not positive. Because what's the opposite of not positive? I mean, sorry, what is another way to say not positive? Negative. It's not negative. Positive. Zero is not positive. So if you say something is not positive, it's, if, instead of saying n is greater than, it's not the case that n is greater than zero, that's not the same as saying n is less than zero, it's the same as saying n is less than or equal to zero. So non-positive is not the same as saying negative. You, you gotta worry about zero, you know. Maybe, maybe it'd be better if I start out with not all integers are negative. And you know, you're saying some integers are non negative. So not being not positive is the same as saying less than or equal to zero. Last one. This is all you people that are going to go on and take analysis one day. For every positive number. Epsilon, so that's a, looks like a little, it's like a backwards three, but it's Greek letter epsilon. So for every positive number epsilon, there is a positive number capital M for which the 
half the value of f of x minus b is less than epsilon whenever x is greater than n. So this is the kind of statement you write all the time in an analysis class. This is this is really um, calculus. Um, when you know when you guys have taken calculus, you talk about limits, like what's happening to a function as x gets really big, for example. Um, well, this is how this is the rigor behind those statements that your professor might have made about well, the function is getting closer to this number m as x gets really big. Well, this is what it means to get really, really close or, or to a limit. The absolute value of f of x minus b, that's the distance from f of x to b. So actually, f of x is getting closer and closer to b when x is getting bigger than m, really, really big, usually. Okay? So this is the kind of stuff you see a lot in, in, in an analysis class. This is, what is, this is called, you know, there's other, other things called delta epsilon proofs. You have an epsilon, you'll say, for every positive number epsilon, there is a positive number delta, and those proofs, there's a ton of those proofs in analysis. Okay? So, for every positive number epsilon, for every epsilon greater than zero, that's how you would write that, for every positive number epsilon, you just write for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a positive number m, okay, there exists an m greater than or equal to zero. The next phrase is a conditional phrase, conditional sentence for which the absolute value of f of x minus b is less than epsilon whenever x is greater than m. So the absolute value of f of x minus b is less than epsilon twice? Nope. This is, this is q whenever p. So, this, so I would write this as x is greater than m implies the absolute value of f of x minus b is less than epsilon. So usually m is going to be a really big number, and you would say, uh, no matter how small you can choose epsilon, I can find uh, an m really big that when x is really, really, is even bigger than m, then the distance from f of x to b is going to be really, really small, less than this. Okay? So usually you think that when you do these proofs, epsilon is going to be a really small positive number. Okay? And so in analysis, you'll, you'll, you'll start out with this all the time. Uh, you'll, you'll say, you know, let epsilon be greater than zero. And, I mean, this is how proofs go. And you just do this all the time in analysis. Let epsilon be greater than zero. Okay? And you write this so many times that um, I heard that you know, the shortest math joke is um, let epsilon be less than zero. Ha ha ha. Anybody said analysis, you know, epsilon is always a small positive number. So, this is some. Something when you know and learn some analysis. Um, all right, so <laughs> that's all of 2.9. So two, really, 2.9, I think 2.9, 2.7 is kind of the same, really, it should be the same section. It's just one, you're translating logic to English, one, you're translating English to logic. Okay? So homework, do Monday, so 2.9, uh, page 55. Number one, two, three, four, five, nine, and ten. And again, you notice a lot of odd number problems there. And usually, like up to this point, I only saw like one odd number problem. So, that, so I, I, my point is, I want you guys to be looking at how you, you know, it's okay to look at the back of the book. Just try not to copy out, you know, the back of the book. But I want you to think about the problems. Think about how you would translate that sentence to symbols. If you really get stuck. Take a look at the book, but um, try to you know try to think about it before you go ahead and cheat. <laughs> yeah. There's no yeah, there's no homework for two point eight. So really today there's two point seven, two point nine. And it's, it's one is symbols to English, the other one is English to symbols. Okay. And half of them are in the back of the book. Alright, so I think we're gonna we're gonna set a good place. We'll do really there's only one real more real section I need to cover from chapter two for the test, the two point ten, which is using negation of quantified stuff. So the rest of it is kinda of like
notes to the, to the students that are reading the textbook. So, pretty much the uh, next week is just. Yeah. So we'll have. Yeah, your homework due Monday, and then up to, so just up to this 2.9 will be on, we'll have a quiz next Wednesday on that, okay? So then we'll have section 2.10, which we'll have, we'll have a quiz on. Okay? We still have to have that on the test. The test coming up December 10th. So, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe, you don't know. You don't know, it could be. Um, so February, February 10th. So we go back here next year. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I